uh, welcome again to uh, Hashing Over History. Uh, today we have uh, an exciting speaker. After last week's uh, uh, discussion of Hashing Over History, I went over to uh, Becky's to make sure everything was good for today. And she told me when I arrived, she goes, well, you come to my 95th birthday. So last week, 95 years old. We're, we're uh, pleased to have her. Before I uh, turn the time over to her, I do want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the green circles that many of you have probably seen in several of the businesses around town. Around town, and like, you, you don't know what the age of buildings are. But you see these circles now, and they'll say built 1888, built 1914. So that's what these green circles are, is telling you the age of the building. Now, everyone that's in the village, we encourage you to get one of these circles even for your house, even if it was built in 1985. You know, put a green circle in there. Uh, but you can talk to uh, Linda Schlaer in the back. Uh, we have a gentleman uh, that will do the build. You tell us the year. So we don't have the history on every building in the village. We wish we did. But by doing these green circles, you're helping us and you're helping the community know what the age of your building. And we're working primarily focused on the historical district ourselves as, a, as the historical team. But again, we invite all uh, homeowners in the village to do that. So. Again, hashing uh, over history today, a partnership with the Thousand Island Museum. It's with the Historic Successful Centennial Historical Committee. It's with the, uh, I, I think I said the Thousand Island Museum. I get mixed up. Myself as the historian, I'm Tom LeClaire, and obviously the Opera House, they're letting us use this building for free. So uh, yeah. that's off to them. All right, so very good. And we're, we got Patty who's filming the uh, Hashing Over History, Patty Lasham. And all these are going up online. So they're going to be preserved for years to come. But we're thankful that we have the in house attendance. Uh, it's great to see it online, but it's wonderful to be here in person and you can meet and greet and talk and hear firsthand. So, uh, so we do have uh, uh, Becky Pacific. Uh, she, again, I said 95th uh, birthday, she's going to tell stories, but she's been around Clayton for a lot of years. And, uh, <laughs> one, one of the things that I said on Facebook is she's got some stories to tell, and I noticed a few people said, I bet she does. So, thank you for time to Thank you, Tom. And good to be here and see all some of these people I haven't seen in quite a while because of the pandemic and bad weather and my age. I don't get out like I used to. You know, as Tom mentioned, things change. And in 1998, I brought the picture of the house I live in that was brought across on the ice on the sled drawn by horses. how it has changed, and my house has been changed too. And I'm still living in it, all to State Street. <laughs> okay. It dawned on me that a lot of people, if you were born here or moved into here, I was already here. <laughs> That's true. So I thought, nobody knows really where I came from. So I was born in Dickinson Center, New York, and I spent the first 10 years of my life in the North Country. The first few years was in Constable, New York, very close to the Canadian border. The last 10, few years was in Scary, New York, which is about between 8 and 10 miles from the moon. It's a hamlet like. You blink your eye and you can miss it. It had a one-room schoolhouse, universal church, sawmill, and a grocery store. And so my dad had a serious heart condition. He was a lumberjack and got caught between two logs and had a rupture so he couldn't work. A relative from Clayton contacted him and told him that 
If he came to Clayton, the family could find work at factories and restaurants and grocery stores. It would make it much easier for my family to survive. So in April of 1937, we moved to Clayton. And we moved in uh, 715 Mary Street. And that picture is in this case. In 1958, oh, I did it myself. Sorry. <laughs> in 1958, and we moved here in 1937. So it was prior to Katie living there. The only difference I can say is when we lived there, there was a, another door right above your other the one down below, oh. and it had two porches on it, one on each floor, which included the two inner windows. Nice. Oh, different, huh? Yes, and I used to sit in the window and listen to the orchestras from the casino. Oh. I didn't realize at that time how beautiful music it was. I just listened. It was new and very enjoyable. At that time, I remember that right across the street, between the lumberyard and Hans, was a marine and shop, and I'm quite sure it belonged to Tom Turgeon. I, or was it the Denny shop? Because the Denny machine shop was right straight across. <laughs> I think that's what it originally was. A it was a marine. Yeah, marine. A, a, marine. a metal building, and they worked on motors and right straight across. But that, because Turgeon was more over on the other side yeah, of the building. Well, so. I wasn't sure. Uh, Turgeon's was the only marina that we couldn't play in because he didn't let no kids hang around. <laughs> <laughs> well, this place, and I will, you'll have to follow along because when we were doing it, names came up in buildings that you people, you know, you wouldn't know about. So, but that place that Teddy's picture was owned by a Mr. Delaney who lived on James Street in the house right across from the Catholic Church, which later was occupied by a Dr. Merrick. Now I've heard no, nothing or read nothing on Dr. Merrick, but I know he was there because my sister Rita had a strap throat and then we took her up there to that place for her to be treated. Uh, okay. My brother and I, Rudy, and there were four of us left to home when, my, when uh, we moved to Clayton. The two older daughters, and my brother was Rudy, and he held a tape. <laughs> the papers when you put them up here. Yeah. <laughs> and two, uh, my brother Rudy, was two years older than I, and we went to school, walked through the park, over to the big brick building where the municipal building now stands. When we walked through the park, even though my dad was Catholic, and I had heard about nuns, remember, I was young, we lived in the country, I had never seen nuns with habits on, and so many kids, they came from the Catholic school and the other school, and so when we walked through there, it was very puzzling to me and what a surprise to see the nuns with their white habits on. And I just was amazed and it was quite a shock to me to see them. And we walked from one room schoolhouse to a large 2-4 school, which was in the other school we spent 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon, that was my education on reading, writing, and arithmetic. So the big school was the red brick building where the municipal building now stands. We had a lot more teachers and a lot more kids to deal with. It sure was different. I thought I was in another world. <laughs> okay, uh, mom was to cook at the Silver Moon Tea Room. It is the, it is the, it was located at the uh, corner of James Street and State Street. And it was owned by Harold and Edgar Corcoran. They had one daughter, 
um, Renita, and she married a stage to pop legal Renita. But her mother was a Charlotte boy, and there was a little house on the State Street side, right on the same property where her mother, Emma's mother lived. She was a Charlotte boy. Grand Charlotte boy lived there. That house has since been moved down. And it's where sliders now are, on the corner. Okay. Um, on 1938, I stood on the sidewalk with a lot of other people and watched the train pull into the coal docks down Riverside Drive, right downtown to the coal docks. And being nosy kid, I sneaked my way into the up front and heard the train coming in. Didn't really know what it was all about. But here comes the train, and on the back was President Franklin D. Roosevelt waving at us. So everybody was waving, so I waved back. <laughs> that was quite exciting. And then years later, when they celebrated the 50 years at the bridge, I was offered tickets to go to it. So I said yes. So Fawn, my father was my husband. It was John Pacific, but they called him Fawn. And Fawn and I went. And at that, the speaker was Governor Nelson Rockefeller. And we got introduced to him and shook his hand. My husband said, I'm not using a sand for nothing. <laughs> 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 When we moved here, Stan and Anna Lewis owned and ran the grocery store in the corner of James and Mary. Now remember, I read stuff in the T.I. Sun on that store, that, and it started with Audrey Brevall. Well, prior to that, my Stan Lewis and Anna, his first wife, ran a, a, a grocery store. And Stan sold large ice cream cones and he sold them for a nickel. He told us later, and I'll tell you why I know, he would sell it for a nickel. He didn't make money on the ice cream for a nickel, but at the end of the season, Mr. Brownell from Pro Joy Ice Cream, which was in the cement block building down on the corner from where the building is, they made Pro Joy Ice Cream and they gave Stan a large size bonus, and that's where the profit came from. And when they would come in for a nickel ice cream cone, they'd see other groceries and buy. So it actually evened its way out, and then the bonuses. And I know this because he married my mother. His first wife died, my dad was dead. Three or four years later, he married my mother. So Stan Lewis was my stepdad. And from there, we moved to the Eaton House on Merrick Street. It's where Tom and Nancy Ogliano now live. And when we moved there, there were nice large rooms. Off the front porch to the left was a nice big player piano. And as a kid, I used to sit there in the summer months, put my hands on the keys and pump away. People walking by would hear it. So I wasn't sure whether they enjoyed the music or couldn't with the bass and be playing the piano. So good. It was fun to, to try to fool people anyway. Well, he sold us. He was always in business. Stan Lewis, we went from one store, he'd sell it, and he'd move into a house, and then he'd see another store. He owned that place on the corner. And then from the Eaton House on Merrick Street, Bert and Eva Garnsey owned the store on the corner where it's known as the Fink store. And Stan bought that from the Garnseys and we lived there. He also sold ice cream from there, but uh, the block away from where Frank Helen lived. Yeah. And uh, I do have the ice cream scoop that he used. It's being used today by me. Carol, my friend. Oh, that was the ice cream cone that was using.
the day has had a lot of wear, but it's still worth it. <laughs> As I said, Stan Lewis was always in the grocery business, and I couldn't find a lot of my pictures. I got rid of a lot of them, given them. But I have a picture here at the end of James Street, right as you go on the riverside, Ellis's Pharmacy. Oh, no, no. And you go in and there was a fountain and just novelties and other stuff. But to the left, and this was dated in 1927, it was a meat market to the left along the side. And this is my stepdad, Dan Lewis. I don't know who these two people are, I never could find out. But I, I can read that here for you. Okay. Um, when we moved into the store on the corner, there was a Mr. Granger who lived in the last house on Webb Street as you're going towards State, just before you get down the road after you go by your house, the last place, and it was Mr. Granger. He had one arm. So he had a 1927 Ford Roadster that he had, and his, he had two daughters, Rosie Cellini and Ivan Tebow, and it's Tebow, T-H-I-A-B-A-U-L-T. Stan bought that roaster from him, and we had it at the store. I had, was used to driving my sister's car, which was up under the wheel, and you shipped in it, what, two pedals on the floor. But this roaster had three pedals on the floor, and the first one was halfway was neutral, to the floor was first gear, the middle was second gear, the third was the brake. Oh, I can't tell you how many times I got into that thing. It was halfway down the block before I realized <laughs> that we had a lot of fun. It started, and once it, it didn't start, kids from the boys from school would come home with me, push it out of the road, down and up and down the lights go up here to get it started. I they jump on the running boards and on the back and they, I take them for a ride all over the town. In fact it he did one time. Jim Stage, who was a cop, went down to the marina I told you about across from 715 Mary Street, got me water and put it in the radiator. He never asked me if I had a license or a something. <laughs> business quite often. He had a brother named Pearl and a sister Anna. Anna lived in Three Mile Bay. That, now remember I'm talking 1937, a long time before Kenny wrote, wrote his book. And um, this is funny because the T.I. Sun I took, I opened it up to the museum and I read here on Pearl Lewis, and Pearl, most, a lot, most of you know that he lived on Webb Street next to Kenny Pickett. Not Kenny Pickett, Kenny He was Eva's husband? Pardon? He was Eva's husband? Eva's Eva. 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 Yeah. yeah. And I read this article, and that was my stepdad, Stan Lewis's brother. Oh. Yeah. Ah. Okay. That was ironic, because I was telling about Stan at this this year here was in there, and I was quite surprised. I knew of Pearl and Eva, but, but I didn't realize why he had lost his legs and what had happened to him. Well, how did it happen? What did he... We missed that one. Oh. He, yeah, the article said at first he was injured in the war, and, and he got shot, and then he... Um, Later, they, he had, um, I think it was sugar diabetes, that he was a diabetic and they amputated both legs before he died. Yes. And evil was possibly there when you, you know, 
was there. And then so they had a son who couldn't walk too, was in a wheelchair. Here, yeah, yeah, yeah. Polio. Yeah. 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 And he had polio. Yeah. 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 Oh, Many things that I don't know about him. I do stand, but even my stepdad, he told me about all of these things. And he would remark about things, um, the Barker House and the Breslow Building and, and uh, revenue and space, things that, things that the young people wouldn't know about. But See, that was that was when I opened that up. I was quite surprised to see that that. But he had uh, Stan died, and he would. We had a store in Omar when Stan died, and it was in the late forties. Um, as far as I'm concerned, this last I'm going to tell you. I graduated from Clayton High School at Watertown School of Commerce. Mr. Parker ran it at that time. Then I went to work for J.A. Stevens in the insurance business in Watertown. I left there and went to work for the Hartford Accident and Deputy Claims Office, opening their first office in Watertown. We worked, I changed as if I ended up with insurance. I didn't expect to, I didn't plan on it, but I guess experience is a good teacher. Once that you had work in that line, they know that you've had experience, so they teach. You seem to be drawn to it. So most of the rest of my life, I worked insurances. As a kid, I worked for many places downtown that uh, Neville's millinery, Green's millinery shop. And it was Miss Neville's and her sister, Miss Delaney, who lived upstairs. And as I worked different places, I would see these ladies come out with a little basket over their arm, and they'd have a nice clean dish towel all folded and over it. They'd go down just before lunch, and back they'd come. I kept thinking, they must have going to get something for lunch. So when I got to work for Gordon in the office, a couple of other ladies came the other direction with their little baskets. And I thought, I'm going to find out where they're going. It's a good time for me to go down to Laura Ryman's and get something to drink. So I went down for a soft drink. I found out where they were getting their lunch. Balanji Liquor Store. <laughs> 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 at the mill in some place here. I got it at my house. And he was close friends of um, Les Corbin. Mm -hmm. And uh, Les, a bunch of boys were down there and they would stand up there and a lot of them would jump. But Fa was a very good diver and swimmer, very strong swimmer. And so when Les said to him, Fa, why don't you go up there and dive off? He said, well, Les, I won't do it once, so make sure you catch me the rest of the time. <laughs> I'll do it the second time. So Fod dove off and they got his picture. Yeah. They yeah. died. Yeah. I always told him that's what happened to him. He hit the water with his head. <laughs> <laughs> he was very strong in early years. He seemed to have a knack of being at the right place to help people. Two young boys from Clayton were swimming, and they went down, and one of them was down low. He didn't come up, and for heaven's sake, I don't know why, Fa noticed him, went down, and 
got him up and pulled him to shore. He said, I said, I would have drowned. I thought I was a goner. So he saved that kid's life. And that was over on Riverside Drive on that side. On the other side, there was, and they're local boys, I know their names. <laughs> on the other side, by the boathouses, a local guy we called Fergie, his last name, <laughs> he went swimming and he also got in trouble. Fog noticed him, dove in, pulled him out. <laughs> There's two lives he saved. He was at a, they, they used to make spaghetti dinners at the American Legion here in Clayton. And he and Sam Fuchs and a bunch of other members were down there making spaghetti. And this one man took a bite of meat and it caught in his throat. And he, he was, he, but he couldn't get it up and nobody was noticing. They were all busy. And by chance, Fa turned around and saw him, did the height of an eye, and that meat flew out of his mouth. And it was, he just seemed to be at the right place at the right time to help me. He didn't do anything spectacular other than just be a good husband, a good father, and save people's lives and help people. And he did. Uh, so Becky, how did you meet Father? Did you go to school with him? Or? Yep, we went to school together. And as I told the boys, the first, we were coming home from school up on Beecher, Clayton Central. And he was walking with some boys and there were some, some of my friends up in front of him. And that, as you know, down Beecher Street kind of slams. And I went to run, I started to run and he stuck his foot out and down my way. You can't introduce yourself. As I said, I'm part French, and my French temper, I scratched the back of my hand, my knee. I got up, and I was so mad, I didn't dare to say anything. <laughs> and he said, oh, I'm so sorry, and helped me up. And I said, what in the devil did you do that for? I was so mad. And the very, just, uh, I, that was the first, because I didn't notice him before. <laughs> Apparently he won my attention. He got it that day. <laughs> and I fixed it later, I married him. <laughs> yes, we were married in September the 12th of 1953. One more question. Yes. The apartment house where I live, which apartment did you live in? Second floor or first floor, right or left? We lived on the second floor down low with my dad when he was alive. He came here in April and my dad died September of that year. We lived in the downstairs. It was cheaper living upstairs, so we moved upstairs in the apartment and up over it to the left. My mother claimed that when she first moved in there, it was $30 a month rent. I don't know what the rent was then, but we had to move upstairs because it was cheaper. Uh, but at that time, and I wasn't going to say anything, but at that time, they did have electricity. And as you went up the stairs, you go straight and there was a toilet, period. And that was used by both apartment sides. Uh, and the light was the bulb, and I being a kid and I'm reaching, you had to turn the light, turn the bulb. Oh, yeah. And when it got dark, I look and get ready to turn that off and run out that door. <laughs> and we sat her down on the corner and play. But the back to my I started to tell you, next door to the house, to the right, when you're going that building you see that old that used to be Wallace Kittle's ice house. He used to go to the river and cut out big hunks of ice and he had uh, metal tongs with big handles on it, and they would bring them in. He stored them in that old building which had hay in it. I know because we played hide and go seek in there. <laughs> and the place next on the corner, the cement building, was the Mr. Brownell who sold, made and sold Projoy ice cream that he sold to my stepfather and many other businesses. <laughs> So was a knitting mill going back then? Or it was was that, that before the knitting mill? 
That was before, uh, that was in 1937. So it's probably a skiff factory or like that. When was the living mill built? What's that? When was the living mill built? It used to be Hans, a skiff factory Hans. first. Hans? Hans. 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 I don't know, I was there when we moved okay. here. Yeah. Right. That was in 1937. <laughs> it was always there. My mother worked there for years and years. I don't know what yeah. else. And Becky, I heard that apartment house was originally up by the church somewhere, and they I, moved it down there. Yes, yeah. it, I had heard that. I heard that it was a prior to it was a church, yeah. and I that think church, it, I yes, but I don't know where it came from or where. I know when you went in the attic, the beams were all chopped out, and it was an old, old building. It was old then. Old, old. It was old when we lived there too. Yeah. Where is that building now? What it's kind of been torn down. It's where the Chris Pertree building oh. was. Here. I'm sorry, but I don't hear a good Did those, every apartment yeah. have its own heat? What's that? Did the heat, when in the wintertime, what did you eat with? A stove? A, wood a stove, stove, right yeah. enough. Yeah, it was a stove. In yeah. fact, yeah. it, it was a kerosene yeah. stove. Oh, well, that's it's a good smell. Good. Good. That's a good smell. Good. smell. Good. It, it would give off such. We washed walls many times. Yeah. Good thing I had sisters to help me. And they did. When, when you started driving, do you recall how much you paid for a, ga a gallon of gas? Well, I do know that when we lived in Omar, and we sold gas down there, it was 17 cents a gallon. <laughs> well, I remember when we bought good brown chuck from the American store. Yeah. where Ernie Heyman worked later in years, and they got three pounds of that good grown chuck for a dollar. <laughs> I got some antiques at my house, and I don't know how I, they were there. Apparently, I overlooked them in my company. But I got some spices, McCormick's, Mark 10 cents, 15 cents. And every time I go to clean up the cupboard, I think, that's an antique, so I push it to the back. I don't know. There wouldn't be any flavor left to it by now. But it's the, the tan, you know? And it's just, I think as you get older, you don't, and I didn't throw anything out as a kid. Bring, bring them to the museum. We got cupboards where some old groceries are stored. Yep. <laughs> well, I don't know what else. Well, look, you, uh, the new school, now Gardino, I think it opened in 1940. When, when did you start going to school up there? In the, uh, at the municipal building, where I started. That's where you started. Did you transfer up yes, to Gardino? Yes, I transferred up there. What year did you start? Seventh going? grade. Mr. Hart was my teacher. George Dupat. <laughs> <laughs> he was the first forever. grade was the one that lives next to Gloria. What was her name? Mystery uh, Streets. Street. <laughs> Betty Streets, maybe? Yeah. Betty Streets, Markham. Miss Markham. Miss Markham. Miss Markham. Miss Markham. Miss Markham. This is the room. Yes, Miss Markham. Yeah. Over here with my teacher. Gwendolyn O'Leary. Helen Bennett. Miss O'Leary. Alice Gray. <laughs> that was a little later than me. <laughs> you so have to remember, I'm talking 30 you know, years older. The beach, was that put in back when you were young, or was that later years, the beach besides the knitting mill? What was put in? The beach. When did they establish the beach there? Yeah. Were you going was to that there you? when you were a kid? That was there oh, when yeah. we moved here. Oh, it's already there in 37. In the winter yeah. months, they put up, it was the ice skating rink. Oh, and the skating rink was over there too. Yes, oh yes. Oh. And, and uh, Fanny Hutchinson's husband was the um, person that was in charge of it. He used to help us put our skates on. Ah. I figured if you have questions. I don't remember the skating rink being there, but I remember the beach because Jack used to lifeguard there in the summertime. So I just remember the beach. I don't remember. Skating rink. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was there in the winter months. Because I thought the skating rink was down by the dump. I mean, it was the dump then. That was after. Yes. Yeah. 
I got pictures of uh, the group with Fa in it, that, where they fly and Fa and a bunch of them at that old one over near the first beach, yeah. over on Mary Street. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I used to go with her skating. You know, what, what was your maiden name with her? Gushwa. Gushwa. Yep, there were six of us. Leela, Herman, Clara, Rita, Rudy, and Rebecca. I'm Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> so the Gushwa family, was that one, the Gushwa's came from Dickinson Center or up in, in St. Lawrence County or Franklin County? To play? Franklin County. Yeah. My dad was, my dad's family originally came from France. And looking up the genealogy there, the name was Goslin. And you know, through the years, they kept changing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, my mom, my dad, father, and mother came to, they settled in Canada. And dad came across, met my mother, and they were married. But the father and mother finally came to the United States, but they were very Dutch Catholics. My mother, my father married a Protestant. So I never got to know the Gushla side of any of them, but they are buried. I found their graves up north, in, in North Bangor. And it was, uh, you know, my sister took me before she died and showed me where it was. But I never went into genealogy because I said, nine chances out of ten the way with my luck, it she might be horse trainers. <laughs> <laughs> side of the family. My mother was Homiston and she was Dutch in England. Wow. Yes, Tom. Can you tell us about your own family, your kids, and how was it raising your children in Clayton? Oh. Oh. <laughs> And uh, he had cousin Ricky and Tony Pacific, and they. Bruno was their father. They were just typical kids. Yeah. Katie probably knows them better than I do. Red blooded, <laughs> red blooded kids. <laughs> yeah, they just uh, they ended up fine, both of them. Um, Tim is now retired, and Todd, because uh, Todd broke his back, the doctor said he'd never work, and Timmy worked for the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. maintenance, that was his last job, and he has um, back problems also, and they both go for doctors and stuff, but at this point, you can't do much for the back from this, yeah. uh, but um, no, for uh, Pleased, and they're both in good, pretty good health other than their back. Yes, Barb? How long did you work for Xerox? From uh, July of 1962 until 1987. And that's another story that I didn't say. Um, I had worked in insurance, and as I said, I think experience is a good teacher, and it kept drawing me back into the insurance business. And uh, when Lalone, Noble Lalone and Gordy Cyril ran for the mayor of Clayton, and Fa knew Gordy, I didn't. I had met him when I worked for his father and mother, and I remember him coming into the story in his white baby outfit with his cap on. They introduced me to him, but that was all I ever knew about him. I didn't know him other than that. And, um, but they, we, Fa and I disagreed on who to vote for, <laughs> and I picked my choice, which wasn't for me. And Pa said, no, it should be for you. He's very, he had a lot of education, and he, he knew better than I did. And one night, we, I was washing dishes at 321 Merrick Street. That's right next to Lessie Doors. 
And the knock came at the kitchen door. And Paul opened the door and it was for him. And he came in, he thought, that's my man. He came in and he said, I'm here to see Becky. And I said, I turned and wiped my hands and I said, have a seat. So we sat down and he said, I want to know who's come to work for me. Well, Todd was two months premature. Both my boys were premature. But Todd was two months premature. He was a little guy. You couldn't get a babysitter. And I was gone on employment. He's gone now. You can't do anything to me. But anyway, I, I said, well, Courtney, I know I'm going to have to go back to work as soon as I can. But Todd's my baby is premature. He's too small to get a babysitter. And I'm drawing unemployment financially. I hate to give it up. He said, that's all right. When does it run out? And I said, in July. Would you work for me then? I said, yeah. So we left. He said, come see me in July. So I came down to this building, downstairs. Fred Westcott was on. And I went in to sign up. And Fred said, uh, Oh, he said, you're going back to work. You're on your time. What time to end it? I said, yes. I think he was kind of trying to make an issue over the fact that I had let my, didn't go back to work until my unemployment ran out. And he said, who are you going to work for? And I said, Gordon Cyril. Boy. Oh, well, tell Gordy, I said. <laughs> that was just weird how it happened. And so, yes, I went to work for Gordy in July, and uh, Carol Carrick had stopped at the office quite a few times when he knew I was alone and asked me. And Gordy often said, take tarts when tarts are passed. And so I figured it was time to take the tart. It was a much better offer, less work, less time, more money. It was beneficial. So I left and went for Harold. Harold had cancer and his time was limited. He needed someone with a, with a license and I had a general agent's license and I was a um, noted republic also which helped both ways. I went up for Harold, and um, I went in there, and Harold died in October. And I took over as, over as manager, and needless to say, I signed, I sold and signed insurance policies. It was sportsman's insurance, and he sold horse shows, pig shows, and insurance. And I sold the insurance for them, and, uh, it worked out well. I retired in 1992 and had seven years of golf and good times with Ma. Ma died October 9th of 1999, and I'm still at home to St. Street, so it worked out fine. I don't have anything but what I have. I cherish and take care of and love. And I have nothing but love for my parents, and for my stepdad, if anybody ever tried to spoil a person, it was Stan who was trying to spoil me. <laughs> he was very good to me. I couldn't, he was a piece of a man, I'll tell you. So anybody, any more questions or anything? I do. Yeah. All right, I'm sorry that I'm asking all the questions, but so you, you obviously were raised as a, a young person. You didn't have computers, you didn't have cell phones. Now today's generation is born with a cell phone in their hand. What would your advice be to today's kids if you could talk to them and say, you know, when I was a kid, what would you tell them? First, you know, knowing that they're on the computer or on the cell phone all the time. <laughs> yes, I understand that. The technology is just a little too much. They, they have to learn. You go to the store, you buy something, if the cash register says, give me back $100, they just pass you $100. They can't make change. And that's bad. I think that I, I count my money, and I stand there and count, and I look and see, and when they ring it up, I do. And you can see, I watch for change, and I said to my granddaughters, I got three of them, and I used to take them to Watertown, and I was the one who only left their billfold in the car, so Grandma would buy them. And I told them, you, come, you know what you give them, and you 
get the right change and don't do me next door to you make sure that I get my right change back. <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing I would tell them to use the equipment as it was intended originally, not to sit there and play games on. Get outside. God made a beautiful world with pretty trees and green grass and a beautiful sky and white clouds and so many things. Take advantage of God's gifts to us. But they don't. They stand there and get there. Some Jenny has my disposition. And God loves Kelsey. She's a top-notch gal. But she was sitting at the table no matter who was there and doing that computer. Needless to say, Jenny said, put that computer down. No, no doing that at this table. You respect the people that are here at this table. And that's the way it should be. Because my dad used to say, I only had him for 10 years, but he said many things to me that stuck in with the best things that he did. We sat at the table, we all sat to eat. We had to go to the table. Your face had to be clean, your hands and your hair had to be clean. And you didn't grab food. It was put on the plate and passed. And you didn't take any more than you could eat, and you ate everything on your plate. And I think I just got away from it. And you grab something and run. I know because I had two boys that wrestled and played football, and we come home from work, and I had sandwiches made, and off we go forever to the football game or the hockey game or whatever. That it got us in a rut for that we just chased and not take time to enjoy the beautiful things of life. Yeah, that's true. Can you? A uh, couple of things. Uh, do you remember over at the old beach, the wall that used to be there and the steps to go down to the water, they were all marble and beautiful? For do you that? remember at the, at the public beach across from the house where we grew up? There was a beach, but above the beach was a, a beautiful wall put in, I think it was marble or something, like, not a white marble, but it had nice steps in it and all like that. I wonder if that was buried. All this wall and the steps were all buried. I don't remember that. Don't, you were the lifeguard there. Yeah. Yeah. You remember in the middle of the beach, huh? you went around the other one, one side down to the beach, but at there the beach side there was a set of stairs to go down. There were little steps to go down in one area. Yeah. The rest of it was just sand. And it was nice it was stone, it was nice stone, I remember. Really nice stone. I don't remember that. Of course, I didn't care about the other, the other question is, can you elaborate any more about being living next door to the casino? That must have been quite an experience. Of no Besides the noise of people you see going in and out of there oh, yes. and different stuff, it must have been hopping. Because it's both been one of the most hopping places this side of the Mississippi. Or... <laughs> oh, yeah. It was nice. I guess. And I also, people hated it pretty bad, too, back then, I heard. What's that? People hated that casino pretty bad, I heard, Why? a lot of people. Why? Because it's a wild place. I never heard that. Of course, I was young. You've got to understand, my dad had gone. My mother was working, and she had very control. I mean, we weren't allowed to go very far. I know that Donna and Myrtle had me up, and they were questioning Elder, Elder James Street. But as a kid, not 10 years old, my mother didn't allow me to go certain places by myself. They watched you. You had to know where we were. I mean, she, even though she had to work, and I respected her, and I did what she told me, but I couldn't walk way up James Street. So I didn't get to know some of the places up there that if it was downtown where the people would that knew me and my sister who worked there could keep track of us and know it was a new place to me. Young kid, we could get in trouble very easily. But, yes. Becky, uh, I'm sure you remember Bob's hole in one. On number nine at Bertrand's. I was on um, eight green when he uh, got that hole in one in the Legion tournament and I was playing with Bob Weaver. I don't I don't remember who Bob was playing with, but I know it ended up being a long day. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember at 
a Clay Country Club. It was on number nine. Yeah. He hit it. He didn't see it going in the, in the hole. I, I saw it way, going on uh, number five. He did it, and I was with him, and so was Chewy Moore and one other man. And we saw it land and go in the hole. That was more thrilling because you'd see the ball roll. Fowler, he was a caddy, a, a golf caddy when he was young. He was interested in golf and wanted me to learn. He, the American store was open. He gave me grocery money and uh, the wood was like $3 and an iron was $4. So I had my grocery money, and every week when I went down, he'd say, there's three dollars. Now pick up the number seven or the number five or whatever, because that's just three dollars. And Big Mary Bush worked there. So I was going to get my groceries. Oh, Big Mary, I said, it's a number seven or a golf club, or golf wood, and I bought it. And when I got to, I had the whole set, and they were Dorothy Pins. And I had to cut off for my granddaughter, but I didn't even know Dorothy Payne. So I got in the league in 1963, and I played in the Clayton Golf League for, for until 2012. My pelvis cracked, and the doctor said, your bones are weak. So I gave golf up. I sunk a sum, and the only time I played in 86 innings is golf tournament, which we've had for years. Last year, it was her first year, and she had the tournament, and it was to benefit Mary Bastion Memorial. Mary Bastion was the physical ladder coach, or whatever you want to call it, to hear the place for years. I knew her through golf and bridge and stuff, and uh, so we, we had it, and she said to me that I wouldn't play in the hot day. And we went up to her place on the Cape Road after. I went to the Legion, that was their main office. And uh, <laughs> afterwards, they came in, gave the scores and stuff, and when it was all ready, she had raised over $5,000 to go to this fund, to the Mary Bastion Fund. Wow. And she warned me to get ready for this year because she's going to have another one. It's for a good cause. What does it go for? The, the, the somebody for the scholarships. She oh, gives scholarships okay. to the coaching that Mary yeah. used to do. Okay, I figured there's a lot more questions. Anybody else? I'll ask another one. <laughs> Fowl was a fireman, right? Yes, he was. Those firemen conventions used to really make Clayton jump up and down. <laughs> <laughs> and nowadays you barely even know they're going on. Yeah. I can remember the fire trucks and the fun and Clayton and Clayton would just lit up. He was but, the racing team. Yeah. Yeah. The racing team, everything was big. Uh, yeah, and Fon was one of them that was bouncing up and down. <laughs> <laughs> I thought all of them. And, and, yes, I've got books from the fire department and I've got the book books. I'll tell you, I've got files and I keep them and I got to get busy and throw them out. I did throw a lot of pictures. Don't throw them out. Don't throw them out. <laughs> get tired to get in and hold them out. Todd, you hear me too, right? Don't throw them out. Well, I just had two bridge players. That was Tracy O'Brien and uh, Linda Renshaw. They just left and they played bridge with me. That's another thing I've done. I played contract, duplicate, all sorts of bridge. Started in 1958, and I've continued, and I still do. And I wish that they taught it in school because it keeps your mind clear. It keeps your, I don't know, done good by me. So. Okay. And she went. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm going to give it to you. Yeah. Let's see, Dora. We lived on, on Merrick Street across from where Mary Mercer lived and Harry. Harry with his two big dogs. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> this is Leslie Dora. She died when she was 104. She lived in the greenhouse where Freddy's lived. 
had to know Don just died. And she, her birthday was December the 4th. And she was a nice old lady, but she used to call, and I, Mary, Martha, and I, and the neighbors used to go over and spend time with her because she was so alone. Her son Roscoe was, ran the Golden Acre with Mary Fitzgerald. And so we would go over and do. And uh, on Sundays when I needed a babysitter, my mom would come down and babysit, and I would fix a big dinner Two plates, mom would take them over and sat and eat with Leslie. And she was a nice company, a lot of fun. But anyway, one time when she called me and she said, Becky, this is Leslie. Can I borrow a potato? I said, sure, Leslie. I had about eight or ten of them, so I split them in two, took them over to her. I don't think she needed the potato. I think she wanted company. <laughs> now, this is a picture I've had of her. She gave me a nice little dish to remember her by. It's really old and it's got signs on the back and numbers and everything. Yep, but that I going to leave for the museum and the picture of my stepdad. I had a picture of Marion Corbin. She was Les Howard Corbin's sister, Howard Corbin's wife. I can't keep the front and I put it in the back of another picture so nothing would happen to it. So I gotta find it. If I do, I'll give it to the meeting. All right. Any last questions? Any, any more questions? Hey, Tom. Who's that picture that I'm up there? It's like I had one of those. Uh, Mr. Skinner. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Mrs. Skinner. Skinner's Skinner his wife. I was gonna say, where's Mar Marilyn? So they're asking about the photo. Where she are you? Oh, left. she just left. All right, so it's in Marilyn Hutchinson's uh, ancestry. It's the Skinner. It's Mrs. Skinner. Oh, I've yeah. got Skinner fame. I had a bunch of old photos at my other house, and I love to swear I had that picture. So one more question, Becky. Yep. Where did you mainly go swimming around Clayton? Downtown or up in the bay? Where did you swim mainly when you were up? At the beach or downtown or? Well, the swimming pool first. And then we, for a long time when the kids were small, that's why my two sons can swim and dive. I was Betty Ingerson and I, she had two girls, and I worked half days for Gordon. And we'd take turns driving, and we'd go to um, the park. Grassy Point? To, uh, Cedar, Cedar, Cedar Point. Cedar, not Cedar, but down there. Grassy Point. And so we take them down there, the four of them, the two girls and the two boys, and they would, it was a nice beach and they'd go swimming. And from there we joined the, with Colton, we joined the seaway and had privileges at the, oh, at the okay. pool up there, ah. across the road. So then all, everybody would go up there and swim. That was before they put the arena in and the swimming pool at the park up here in Clayton. And we swam there. The Seaway Pool was nice. My mother was a bartender. Yes. So I had to be one of the first ones swimming there. It was something nice because a lot of kids learned how to swim and dive. And when you live near the river, I can tell you it's important they know how to swim, take care of themselves because we've lost a lot of people to the water. They've become better, most of them. But mm -hmm. Now the swimming pools, a family that I worked for a long time ago had one of the first swimming pools in the United States, but they didn't have filters or anything on it. My boss says that that would get horrible yuck until they change the water. <laughs> but that seaway pool, that was nice. Uh, I just wanted to say there were a lot of businesses in Clayton that were there. And you have to remember, when I first moved here, 1937, that are not here now. And uh, I know a little bit about them. So if anybody has a relative or wants to know anything about it, contact me. I'll tell you whenever I can on it. Okay? Thank you.